Hey everybody, <clears throat> this is a little article from Labor Action, uh, published in June 25th, on June 25th, 1951. Uh, it's titled, The Fourth International's Capitulation to Stalinism, by Max Schachtman. The subtitle is, quote, Official Trotskyist, end quote, see, Communist Party power as road to socialism. Uh, the reason I'm reading this is because I saw it in the in the footnotes or the bibliography rather of uh, Marcel van der Linden's uh, Western Marxism in the Soviet Union, <clears throat> and uh, I've been looking into looking at the work of Socialisme au Barbary and uh, trying to get a feel for some of the uh, context within the late 40s, early 50s Trotskyist movement that uh, that that paper and was a that that project emerged out of. Um, I'm not an expert on these matters at all, so uh, but it seemed like a interesting article, so an interesting little uh, primary source document. The declaration of Natalia Trotsky, in which he breaks with the Fourth International and with the Socialist Workers' Party, is a stiff jolt to those pseudo-Trotskyist organizations. Coming from this tireless veteran of the socialist fight against Stalinism, it will make it harder for the Canaanites to use the banner of Leon Trotsky for their march into the Stalinist camp. Every socialist challenge against capitulation to Stalinism is good. Coming from Natalia Trotsky, it is doubly good. What she challenges is nothing less than capitulation to that totalitarian reaction which Trotskyism rose to combat more than a quarter of a century ago. Capitulation to Stalinism. Is that possible for the movement once led by Trotsky? It is not only possible, it is happening. For that you need little more evidence than is provided by the Canaanites themselves in their answer to Natalia Trotsky. Let us understand what constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. The idea that Stalinism is a legitimate part of the working class movement and therefore a legitimate class ally of the socialist wing of the working class movement that constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. The idea that the Stalinist state is a working class state of any kind, that the Stalinist bureaucracy in some way defends the interest of a worker state and thereby the interests of socialism, that constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. The idea that the working class all over the world is duty bound to defend the Stalinist state, which is nowhere equaled for its outrages and crimes against the working class and socialism. That constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. The idea that socialists who refuse to defend the Stalinist state automatically or inevitably fall into the camp of capitalist reaction. That constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. The idea that Stalinism must be supported wherever it fights capitalism or the capitalist class, even though it simultaneously crushes the working class, democracy, and socialism. That constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. The idea that Stalinist bureaucracy is capable of establishing and has already established workers' states outside of Russia and has done it without the working class against the working class, that constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. The idea that Stalinism has a historically revolutionary or historically progressive role to play and plays that role regardless of what the working class itself does in its own name and with its own independent movement. That constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. The idea that Stalinism must be supported wherever it nationalizes all property, even though this nationalization, nationalization gives it the most exceptional opportunities to enslave workers and peasants as they were never before enslaved. That constitutes capitulation to Stalinism. Trapped by their dogma.
The last 25 years of world history have proved or disproved many things, but at least one thing they have proved incontrovertibly. Every single socialist or Marxist, inside or outside of Russia, who capitulated to Stalinism did so on the basis of most, if not all, of the ideas cited. Offhand, we cannot think of a single notable exception among the capitulators. The Iron Rule, however, is represented by a huge number ranging from the great and tragic cases of former Bolsheviks like Zinoviev, Kamenev, Radek, Rakovsky, Priobrzezhensky, Bukharin, down to Mensheviks like Don, and social revolutionists like Rubanovich, non-Russian social democrats like Zerom Zeromsky in France, Nenny in Italy, the Webbs and Strachey in England, not excluding leaders of the Trotskyist movement in France, England, Germany, and Poland. On this outstandingly important fact, you will not find a single word or hint in the reply of the Canaanites to Natalia Trotsky, for, very, excuse me, for good reason. Every single one of the ideas listed is held and defended with different degrees of forthrightness and firmness by virtually all the, quote, authentic, end quote, spokesmen of the, quote, authentic, end quote, Trotskyist movement, both here and abroad. Some of these ideas are not yet as carefully developed as others, but those that are lagging behind are catching up with those that are still ahead. The Canaanites are trapped by a dogma which is false to the core. To them, Stalinist Russia is still a worker state. Trotsky wrote that long ago. That constitutes overwhelming proof to them, and in any case, more than enough. To Natalia Trotsky's contentions that Russia can no longer be considered a worker state in any sense, they have a crushing reply. Multiple quotations from Tr Leon Trotsky's writings in 1939 to 1940. What better, better proof do you need? Ask the Canaanites to show you that the United States is a capitalist state. Without difficulty or hesitation, they will pile up unanswerable facts and figures to show that the capitalist class owns, controls, owns and controls the means of production and exchange, and therewith the means of life, that the state machinery and the government are controlled by the same capitalist class and are operated in its interest in every decisive and basic respect, that the same capitalist class basically determines the conditions of production, that the main beneficiary of the toil of the workers is not the working class, but still the same capitalist class. <laughs> that this class owns or controls or decisively influences virtually all of the press, the radio, the movies, the big political parties, and so on and so forth. You'll be worn out before they exhausted a fraction of the factual material to prove the point. Ask the same Canaanites to show you that Stalinist Russia is a worker state, instantaneous and sole proof, in Russia, all property is owned by the state. By what state? The state established by the Russian Workers' Revolution in 1917? No. That state has been destroyed root and branch, and so have all those who established it. Whose state, then? The state of a bureaucracy, which is the Canaanites concede, anti-working class, anti-democratic, anti-socialist, out-and-out counter-revolutionary, despotic, Bonapartist, totalitarian, and similar to the fascist bureaucracy. Restoration of Capitalism This bureaucracy is the main beneficiary of the tail, excuse me, of the toil of the workers and peasants. It runs the state, the government, the army, the police, the economic, political, and cultural life of the country, and runs them exclusively and tyrannically. It runs the biggest slave camps in world history. Its factories and mines are penitentiaries to which the workers are sentenced for life. Its exploitation and oppression of the people has no equal anywhere. It tramples underfoot the right of self-determination of dozens of nations, nationalities, and peoples. It punishes socialist ideas with imprisonment or a bullet in the base of the skull. It stimulates anti-Semitism and chauvinism in general. It tolerates no working class or social, or social 
capitalist organization of any kind, but its state is a, quote, worker's state, end quote. Do the workers own the property or have any control over it? No. Do they control the state, the army, the police, the government national, nationally or locally, or are they allowed to so much as try to control them? No, not in the minutest degree. Are they allowed to organize or strike? No. Do they have any rights of any kind? No. Are they allowed to determine, even to a tiny extent, the question of their daily life at work or at home, or the questions of peace or war? The Canaanites will continue to reply, no. Have they any power at all in this worker state? No. None whatsoever. But Russia is a worker state because all property is in the hands of the state which, which enslaves the workers. Prove to the hilt. But cry the Canaanites, it is a degenerated worker state because the Stalinist bureaucracy is counter-revolutionary. Indeed it is. But what makes it that? At this point, the nightmare becomes more nightmarish and dogmatism reaches the point of insane, no, inane, blindness. Originally, and for years after the fight against the Stalinist bureaucracy was started, Trotsky designated it as counter-revolutionary because he insisted that it represented the tendency to undermine state property and restore private property. and therewith to restore capitalism in Russia. That view was then justified because it appeared for a time that this was the tendency actually represented by Stalinism. But only for a time. It very soon turned out that Stalinism represented nothing of the sort. The fact of life completely dashed this theory. Excuse me, the facts of life completely dashed this theory. But what do the Canaanites care about facts when they are trapped by a dogma? In a reply to Natalia Trotsky, they write, quote, You identify Stalinism with planned economy based on nationalized property in the Soviet Union, but from a dialectical point of view, these are opposites. We have defended planned economy inside the Soviet Union against the tendencies toward restoration of capitalism fostered by Stalinism, end quote. What, where, when, how? In what way are they, quote, opposites? End quote. From the dialectic or any other point of view, is it a fact or not that the Stalinist bureaucracy owes all its power, economic, political, and social, to maintaining ownership of all property by the state which they completely control? What would this bureaucracy amount to if its state did not allow all of the property? Nothing or next to nothing. Trotsky himself wrote about this bureaucracy that state property is, quote, the source of its power and its income, end quote. Why should it do anything but strengthen and expand this source from the dialectical or any other point of view? How they oppose Stalinism. Where has Stalinism, quote, fostered, end quote, the, quote, tendencies towards restoration of capitalism, end quote, by destroying the Netman, the wholesale terroristic, quote, liquidation of the Kulak, end quote, by its huge, unforeseen, unexpected expansion of state-owned industry beyond anything dreamed of in Lenin's day, by its rigid maintenance of the monopoly of foreign trade, by its crushing of the capitalist classes and abolition of capitalist property in Poland, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and everywhere else it took power? Where are the facts to sustain this incredible fantasy in the year 1951? Where is even one good substantial fact? Do not waste precious time by even asking them for a fact. The Canaanites will produce one when duck eggs grow hair. Not before. It is not, of course, this supersonic fantasy about Stalinism which leads the Canaanites on the road to capitulation. On the contrary, it is the reality of Stalinism which leads them down this road. On the days when it is perfectly obvious, 
even to the Canaanite Phantasmagorians, that the Stalinist bureaucracy is defending and extending its state property. The Canaanites who identify it with a worker's state are obliged willy-nilly to support the bureaucracy. And since those days number exactly 365 in the year, the Canaanites not only cannot break away from their fundamental attachment to Stalinism, but are inexorably drawn closer to it. It is exactly as if a devout Catholic were to proclaim that he intends to fight to the death against the Pope and the Church of Rome because, or rather, if they, quote, foster tendencies, end quote, towards atheism. In view of the real nature of the Church and Bishop of Rome, it is not hard to understand that in real life our devout, if unlikely Catholic, would do very little fighting against them. He would, quote, capitulate, end quote, to them in practice. So it has been with the Canaanites here and the Fourth International in general. They repeat with ritualistic regularity and hollowness that they, quote, oppose the expansion of the Soviet Union under the Stalinist regime, end quote, as they say in reply to Natalia Trotsky. The statement is utterly valueless and politically fraudulent. In these very countries, where they, quote, oppose, end quote, the expansion of Stalinism, they propose to the people that in the event of war, it is their duty to, quote, defend unconditionally the Soviet Union, end quote, which has reduced them to vassalage and worse. What the Canaanites propose to these peoples is infinitely more important politically than what they claim to oppose. The Stalinist bureaucracy has only to say, quote, look, we are defending nationalized property in our own miserable way to be sure, but we are defending it nonetheless, end quote. And the Fourth Internationalists instantly snap to attention and proclaim, as they did in the last war, quote, we are the best soldiers in the, quote, red, end quote, army, end quote, as they call this military instrument of Stalinist Bonapartism and call upon the peoples of the oppressed satellite states and all the rest of the world, quote, ally yourselves to the Soviet Union, defend it and its borders, end quote. The Stalinists naturally demand more from these pseudo-Trotskyists, but they really have no right to. That is enough. The inevitable happened. That is not all, and monstrous though it is, it is not the worst. Natalia Trotsky charges the Canaanites with the view that the satellite states of Eastern European Europe, conquered by Stalinism, are also worker states. Quote, permit us to make a correction as to fact, end quote, they reply. Quote, the Socialist Workers' Party has not yet taken a definitive position on this. The question as to the correct characterization of these countries is now under discussion, end quote. The authors of this pious deception know even better than we know that every, quote, authentic, end quote, leader of the Fourth International and of the Socialist Workers' Party is already committed to the position that the satellite countries of Stalinism are workers' states. They know, even better than we know, that the political position they have already adopted and followed with regard to these countries could and would never be put forward unless they were regarded as worker states. The adoption of this standpoint is as simple as it was inevitable. I permit myself the reminder that I made this clear to the delegates of the Fourth International Congress three years ago. The abolition of private capitalist property and its replacement by state property was inevitable sooner or later in the countries conquered by Stalinism. One fan only phantasmagorians who believe or pretend to believe that Stalinism exists to preserve or restore capitalism could fail to see this. When the inevitable happened, it was likewise inevitable that our pseudo-Trotskyists would again capitulate to Stalinism by conferring upon Stalinism the distinction of having converted the Polish and Hungarian and Czechoslovakian and Romanian and Bulgarian capitalist states into worker states. 
According to all the teaching of Marx and Lenin, this is nothing less than the carrying out of the first important step of the socialist revolution, all the twists and squirming in the world, even when accompanied by phrases about the, quote, dialectical point of view, and quote, cannot efface that conclusion. By that very token, the Canaanites lose all fundamental ground and right to designate Stalinism as counter-revolutionary and therefore to oppose it on the basis of fundamental principle. That is, unless they propose to commit themselves to the very novel, if not dialectical, idea that the counter-revolution can and does carry out the socialist revolution. The drawback to this novel idea is that it means that the end of the fight for socialism, end of socialism itself, in any case it means concretely a capitulation to Stalinism. The international Canaanites are not altogether unaware of the position they find themselves in and the prospects they face. To escape the trap of Stalinism requires a radical break with what Natalia Trotsky calls the old and outlived formulas that obsess them. But it appears that the, quote, authentic, end quote, spokesmen of pseudo-Trotskyism are making the other choice of drawing the trap closer around their necks. Stalin's, quote, left opposition, end quote. Stalin's, quote, left opposition, end quote. In the latest issue of their international magazine, Quatrième International, the head of the Fourth International, Pablo, M. Pablo, presents his discussion article for the Third World Congress of the organization. It represents a first-class disaster for this movement, but at least it has a hundred times more value than the double-talk evasiveness and dirty inquisitions against critics contained in the SWP's reply to Natalia Trotsky. Better yet, it serves to confirm her charges against the Canaanites to the very end. Pablo acknowledges that the members of the Fourth International are disturbed by the course of events and the dislocation of the theories and policies of this organization. To rem remedy all this, he sets forth the new ideas which, alas, have already been adopted in effect for all and for all practical purposes by the pseudo-Trotskyist movement. The coming war between the American bloc and the Stalinist bloc, he writes, will immediately assume the character of a, quote, international civil war, end quote, with the revolutionary masses of Europe and Asia, at least, being on the side of Stalinist Russia and the Stalinist parties in their struggle against world capitalism. That is also the side Pablo, who is a man saturated with the profoundest pessimism towards the prospects of the proletarian socialist revolution, aims to be on. It is necessary, he pursues, to quote, modify, end quote, the Fourth International's position towards Stalinism and the Stalinist parties, as if it has not already been modified enough. The idea that they cannot and will not take power under the, quote, revolutionary pressure of the masses, end quote, and thereby carry out the revolution is incorrect. Quote, both the Yugoslav affair and the course and victory of the Chinese revolution, as well as the other current colonial revolutions, Korea, Vietnam, Burma, Malaya, Philippines, have showed that the Communist parties retain the possibility, in certain circumstances, of outlining a revolutionary orientation, that is, to find themselves obliged to undertake a struggle for power, end quote. Therefore, he continues, quote, unexpected as this may appear at first blush, the new condition in which the communist parties find themselves in the Asiatic countries, which are now witnessing a revolution, dictates to us as our general attitude toward them, by and large, that of a left opposition which accords it a critical support, end quote. It is the end of the theory that the Stalinist parties are counter-revolutionary parties. 
In the context of Pablo's article, the words, quote, in certain circumstances, end quote, are a purely literarious safeguard which modifies nothing in the essentials, and these are, the Stalinist parties are capable of carrying out the socialist revolution. They can be, quote, pushed, end quote, to carry it out. That finishes off all reason for irreconcilable opposition to Stalinism on the part of the Fourth International and all reason for its independent existence. At most, the only role left to it is back to a left opposition, not against the Stalinist parties, but of the Stalinist parties. It goes without saying that no thinking person will take seriously any attempt to confine this analysis and policy to the Stalinist parties of Asia. Not a single sound reason can be given for establishing a fundamental difference between the Stalinist parties of Asia and those of Europe, between those of Europe and those of the Americas. Pablo's attempt in passing to establish a difference is so patently clumsy and ludicrous as to guarantee its early demise. This is what underlined, excuse me, this is underlined by the historical perspective outlined by him. It must be quoted, otherwise nobody would believe that it could have been written by a man who leads the movement founded by Leon Trotsky. Quote, People who despair at, of the fate of humanity because Stalinism continues to exist and even gains victories are shortening history to their measure. They would have liked the whole process of the transformation of capitalist society into socialism to be accomplished within the period of their brief life, so that they might be recompensed for their efforts on behalf of the revolution. As for ourselves, we affirm what we wrote in the first article we devoted to the Yugoslav affair. This transformation will probably occupy an entire historical period of several centuries, which will be filled in between times by transitional forms and regimes between capitalism and socialism, necessarily remote from, quote, pure forms and from norms. We know that this affirmation has shocked certain comrades and has served others as a springboard for attacking our, quote, revisionism, end quote, but we are not disarming, end quote. Where are Trotsky's ideas? Nor is it necessary, Pablo and after him, the international Canaanite movement are already disarmed before Stalinism. Excuse me, nor is it necessary. Pablo and after him, the international Canaanite movement are already disarmed before Stalinism. I do not see Trotsky's ideas in your politics writes Natalia Trotsky to the Canaanites, how right she is. There is as much resemblance between Trotsky's perspective and Pablo's as there is between a fighter against Stalinism and a capitulator to Stalinism. The triumph of Stalinism, wrote Trotsky toward the end of his life, is the beginning of the new barbarism. And he never wrote anything truer and sounder. Pablo is committed heel and crown to the new barbarism and its triumph. Between present-day capitalism and the socialism to come, we will have many, quote, transitional forms and regimes, end quote. They will be, quote, necessarily remote from, quote, pure, end quote, forms and from norms, end quote. Which means, in plain English, they will be Stalinist, quote, forms and regimes, end quote, which he will help, which he will help the revolutionary masses quote, push into power, end quote, as the, quote, left opposition, end quote, of Stalinism. How long will this Stalinist, quote, transition, end quote, this not entirely pure transition last before it flowers into the socialist society? No man can be sure, but Pablo estimates that this unique road to socialist freedom will unwind for, quote, several centuries, end quote. Patience, plus the policies of the Fourth International, will make the voyage less tedious, and the militant who is wretched enough to think of his life being too brief to last him the full length of the road can draw some solace on the thought that his newly acquired Stalinist comrades in arms may always be counted on to cut that life briefer while they lead humanity through not-quite-pure transitions to the socialist future. 
The, quote, Socialist Workers' Party, end quote, says its political committee's reply to Natalia Trotsky, quote, has not yet taken a definitive position, end quote, on whether the Stalinist satellite states are worker states. We record this again, recalling the mock indignation poured out upon our heads 12 years ago by these same Canaanites because we adopted a political position towards Russia in the war without deciding again the question of the character of the Stalinist state. Anyway, we await the, quote, definitive position, end quote, of the Socialist Workers, excuse me, the Socialist Workers Party will adopt towards the perspectives, theories, and policies recommended so philosophically by Pablo. Illusions about the outcome, we have none.